So we're talking about how to survive that first year being an entrepreneur. Dre, you were talking about you got to be somebody that you're not. You're going to have to turn into somebody that you're not quite yet. You're going to have to develop characteristics that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And it's not good enough to say that I'm not that type of person. Mm -hmm. Me, pretty cool guy, pretty laid back. Mm -hmm. I found out that when I'm flipping my own problems, my contract is... You know, doing stuff you shouldn't be doing, taking too long, and now I'm a monster. I gotta turn into an animal in this guy. Yeah. That I'm not. <laughs> so now I'm up here ready to strangle people, fight, do whatever has to be done yeah, yeah. to get this job to done. To get the job done. And this is what it comes down to as an entrepreneur. It's either these people are not gonna do it, are not gonna do mm -hmm. what, what you need them to do, and your family's gonna starve. Or you're going to do whatever it takes to get them to do what you need to do and your family go eat. Shift and focus to the black woman's boot camp and female entrepreneurs. You might not have all the attributes you need right off back to be an effective business person. They might not come for years. But keep working on them and keep developing different characteristics that you don't have that you're going to need to be efficient in your business. If you know that you're a nice person and you're push, you're a pushover, maybe you might want to incorporate somebody with you who's a hard ass. Maybe you might want to get some techniques to try some things to help you be more aggressive and more forceful because it's going to be necessary. If you're too forceful and don't know how to talk to people and people don't want to work with you, maybe you need to bring in a manager who can be a little bit more nicer, right. who can be a buffer zone between you and your employees and your customers. All these different things have to be done because it's, it's not enough to say it doesn't work. You have to work it. Anything can work if you work, if the desire is there and the hard work is there. Shifting your emotions and your feelings and your characteristics, mm -hmm. subsidiary, of what you have to do. Your employees have to respect you. So that they, and they got to realize that when they're on the clock, they're on the clock. This is company time. And especially when you're black and you got another black person, sometimes they might come to work and feel like they don't have to work as hard. As the boss, you gotta set the tone. You gotta set that. You gotta set the tone. So you gotta come in out the door as a shining image of what everybody else needs to be doing and enforce that from day one. So when you come in, they gotta know from day one, it's hard to change people once they've been doing something for so long. Yeah. Change is very, very, very gradual in the human mind. And mm -hmm. so you have to set the tone right from day one on how they need to act, behave. Very important. Otherwise, you'll be taking months, sometimes years, trying to change the culture in your environment. With, with my dealership right now, what I'm stressing is, you, as you probably know already, the car industry has a stigma of being grimy. Yeah. Uh, cheesy, even. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of my things that I want to bring in is integrity. Uh, I want to bring integrity and honesty to the to the forefront and push that. And I want to bring the level of intimidation down. Mm -hmm. You know, my environment is very laid back. Everybody's friendly. Everybody's smiling. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to be honest. If there's something wrong, something wrong, we're going to, yeah, we're going to let you know. And we're just going to be upfront as possible mm -hmm. because we feel like we're selling cars to our brothers. Mm -hmm. And as a car dealer, as one of the of one of the very, very, very few black-owned car dealerships in Chicago, I look at all these other dealers and I look at how they do business, and it's not mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. They don't mind selling you garbage because it's, they don't look at you as their people. Mm -hmm. They don't mind giving you a super high interest rate on the car that you're never going to be done paying yeah. off. Because it's not your people. And then there's no repercussion, really, if, if they do give you, you know, they cheat you. There's no, there's no repercussion at all either. And let, let me just back up with that. So after my business uh, was going well for a little while, I got into real estate. Mm -hmm. um, it brought me to working as a manager one time at Toyota. So I switched up from being independent mm -hmm. to work at a major dealership. And to be honest with you, I had fell off in a, in a little bit amount of time. Or at a certain time, mm -hmm. I had fell off. Got low when I needed to work. Later on, come to find out that that was really just God preparing me for where I'm at now. Working on the street, I took I'm like, damn, I'm taking a step back going to work for the man at this dealership. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, now I'm like, that prepared me for everything I'm doing now. Success leaves clues. The last job I had, it gave me so much for where I'm at today. Like they had systems in place. I was able to see the resources. I was able to see the whole process 
because I was working at a, at a college. Mm -hmm. So they had, we had the script, so I learned the exact scripts on how to get people on the phone, get them excited, how to interview them, how to qualify people, and then once you get them in, how to best use the time, mm -hmm. you know, how to sell a person face to face, mm -hmm. you know, so you create a win-win situation. And a lot, if I didn't work there, in fact, before I worked there, I was in similar situations trying to sell people, but it just wasn't clicking. Mm -hmm. Like, it's nothing wrong if you're getting a temporary job somewhere, but just make sure that you're learning, you're taking notes on the whole process so that way you can eventually leave that plantation and then be able to start, incorporate that. Incorporate it. Yeah. Go to a company that's had proven success and steal. Not, not, not the pins. Not don't the pins. Steal the the pins the post, the post don't let them catch you on camera stealing boxes. <laughs> On your off day. On your off day. On Memorial Day. <laughs> but steal the processes. Steal the knowledge. Steal everything you can. They say good art, good artists borrow. Great artists steal. So I would suggest going and stealing everything you can from these companies and implementing it for yourself. Yeah. A lot of people are already working 9 to 5 to a corporate America. And some of them are making pretty good, great money. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to really de redetermine what success means for you. There's different levels of entrepreneurship. Everybody's not going to be full-fledged entrepreneur where you're literally creating a business plan, you're hiring people, you're creating a product. If you can get there, that's where you want to be. But you got to be real with yourself. Maybe that's really not your strength. Maybe your strength really is you having a part-time business that you do seasonal, and if it's just it's making you happy and you know maybe you can eventually take that business and then trans hand that over to a family member in the future but i think it's important that you have to redetermine on what success means to you mm -hmm. it's okay if your personal business maybe only makes a hundred thousand dollars a year everybody's not going to make millions less than five percent of the world actually makes over four hundred thousand dollars a year mm. You have to determine what's comfortable for you because I think too many people are looking at another man's success and, and they think that they're not successful unless they do what those people over there are doing. Fulfilling your purpose in life, money don't matter as much. When you're fulfilling your purpose in life, you're going to be fulfilled. We all have a specific purpose. And, and I'll be honest with you, my business is only a portion of my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I've come to realize that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, what you're passionate about is intertwined with your purpose. Talk about something that a lot of people overlook or just probably are unaware of, and that is the, the high depression and suicide rate amongst entrepreneurship. Mm. Some people can get out of balance real easy in their business, and especially men. And they get so, like their business is like their ego. Their business is their identity. And if their business is not successful, now they're not successful as a man. Then they become too depressed because they feel like, well, you know, I don't get enough time to spend with my family or I don't get enough time. To and a lot of times, you know, it's a chemical imbalance when you're depressed. And then there's a high suicide rate, you know, amongst like trying to make that money back or you didn't put all of your money up, which is something you should never do in my opinion. The only time you should put up every dollar you have is when you only have a, a few dollars. <laughs> but if you have some money, most wealthy people, first of all, they, they don't put up all of their money. Sometimes it's okay to even get other people's money and flip that, but make sure you don't always have to give them equity. You still keep your equity. You maybe just take a loan, you flip that loan, yeah, you give, give them a loan, and, then, and then you give them that money back. So that's one route you could take. Another route, you can go crowdfunding, do crowdfunding, start up a GoFundMe campaign for your business or your project. That's the interesting thing about how to start up, how to get the money to start up. Yeah. I suggest first start bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have a whole lot of money right off the bat, bootstrap. I worked for a while, saved up mm -hmm. while I was working. Lived humble, moved back in with my people, yeah, yeah. you know, to put money into my business, yeah. to grow that. Yeah. And, and, and let me, oh, you need the money to start off, you need to, but let's, I like to do business with the end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. I like to start with the end in mind. My real estate book, the new one that's coming out, 90,000 in 90 days, 
you're going to see that we start off with the end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that mean? Harold's Chicken. Mm -hmm. Harold's Chicken, the owner, is gone now. Harold's Chicken daughter is running the company, mm -hmm. but it's running without a... Now his granddaughter is getting money from Harold's Chicken, and she doesn't have anything to do with the business, mm -hmm. per se. Young girl. So what does that mean? It means that your business isn't just about you. Yeah. Your business is going to be able to feed. You put that work in and sacrifice now so that your lineage, yeah. Yeah. who might not be as strong as Dwayne yeah. is, yeah. who might not be as smart as Andre is, has a chance that mm -hmm. they don't have to work for anybody else and that they can have some money coming in and have something to fall back on if things get bad. Yeah. Come up with a business plan, show it to all friends and family and see if they got some money that they would like to invest in it. And like, again, not for equity, but just for a return. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't take too much money from people outside. I would try to do it myself so that you can live and die with the results yourself. You have to teach your kids entrepreneurship tendencies. And you need to start teaching to them immediately. I mean, little things. Like, I, I personally never really was a big fan of just giving a child money just for nothing. If I'm gonna invest in you, how much are you gonna invest in you? Mm. You know, what are you gonna do, you know, to earn this money? Right. You know, because there's, there's always some work to be done. Right. You know what I mean? I got this money for you, I want you to do something. <laughs> yeah, you gotta do something for it. Take them to work with me. My kid is not coming in, not working mm -hmm. right off bat. Like, we're not gonna even have that problem because they're gonna be at the dealership. Yeah. Every day, from they get five, mm -hmm. six, they washing cars, putting stickers on cars, yeah. you know, greeting customers, mm -hmm. you know, right. just like you go do at the Middle Eastern on gas stations, and you will see an eight-year-old boy mm -hmm. taking your money, mm -hmm. learning, and in ten years he's gonna own a gas station. Well, you know that's a good benefit then of having your own brick and mortar. It's not the same as you getting up, going somewhere every day. And I noticed that from the difference of uh, hustling on the street, mm -hmm. of having like a basically a virtual business as opposed to hustling at my dealership now, mm -hmm. at, at a physical location. You have one spot all day, you got all your energy combined getting stirred up mm -hmm. at one spot all day. Mm -hmm. So what that's going to do is going to be an outbreak of energy yeah. coming from that one spot, especially when there's more people there. Yeah, like you said, your people can come in, mm -hmm. uh, your, your kids can work there, which mm -hmm. is great. I mean, it's, it's a lot of bonuses, of course, the overhead mm -hmm. is a negative. Oh yeah, having that overhead, I mean, that's a part of growth. Yeah. That's a part of building the system. You, you flip a house, you did 90,000 in 90 days. Mm -hmm. But most people would take that money and then they would go spend it on a liability. To just throw away the money. You said, I'm gonna reinvest this. So one thing I know as a hustler is that at the beginning you're gonna be broke because you always flipping. You mm -hmm. all it's all about cash flow. Like I'm flipping all I mean, this day. money to go right You know what I mean? As soon as I make 10 grand, I gotta re reinvest that. And uh, I had some investors and some friends. And when they got their money, a lot of times when I get they, my friends, I see them, they super fresh. Mm. So fresh. Mm. Nice shoes. New fits, yeah. all this. You know, I haven't been shopping in almost a year. Yeah, but I buy a car almost every. I buy a car almost every day, and sell it, and, I, and it's going right back into it, so that I can. For the last few years, I've been broke. Mm. Not because I don't have money, yeah. but it's because I invest all my money yeah. back in my business. Yes, yeah. you you got capital. We got assets. I have a lot of assets. assets. For instance. I'm, I'm buying land right now. I'm buying vacant lots. I don't like to put too much business out there to the streets. Okay. Truth be told, I'm buying lots, vacant land. That's gonna, that's gonna multiply with value in a while. And one of those vacant lots might be worth about a pair of Jordans. This value, value-based mm -hmm. investments, mm -hmm. or just sporadic buys because I call it being insecure because you really need to have all these nice new things all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these Jordans are going to lose value. Read Rich Dad Poor Dad too if you ever get the chance. Assets and liabilities. This lot is going to increase exponentially. Yeah. And it's going to be here after I'm dead and gone. My kids are going to own this land. They can build on it, sell it, do whatever they want to do.